I'm very, very glad and honored to be introducing our speaker, Ian Kirishai, connecting all the way from Thailand to share his insights on how to become a great chef and entrepreneur. Welcome, Ian. Sawadee Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Kirishai. I'm a chef and uh, really excited to be uh, you know, online and talking to everyone from I mean, around the world, right? And then, uh, the and uh, thank, you, thank you, Ian. Hi, hi. Now we can see you. Sorry, hi. I'm sorry. Well, uh, really excited to uh, to meet everyone, and then um, you know, love to uh, chat with everyone who has a question. And then I'm really excited. That's great. This community, the female entrepreneurs worldwide community, obviously we're so glad and honored to have you. You're a celebrity chef, but they're also a very interactive community. And as I said, if anyone along our chat has a question, I'm going to put them on the stage and they will directly ask the question to you. If not later on, we'll have also the opportunity for some Q and A. Okay. But to start, I would like to ask this. We know that entrepreneurship, the journey of entrepreneurship can be challenging, can be sometimes lonely, can be unexpected. It's everything right. and unexpected, right? Absolutely, yeah. So how was your entrepreneurship rainy, uh, journey? How, that, how did you start from being a, a chef and then owning businesses and building them, growing them around the world? I read that you used to go with your mom to the wet market and right. perhaps that's where your inspiration started. So tell us more about the start of your journey and how has it been? Okay, uh, I came from a big family. I have seven sisters and then uh, oh. it's me, only a boy in the family. Wow. And then, uh, <laughs> so this job actually has been passing on from my sister to me because each one of them leave, left to Australia. Okay. To start, but they went with friends and then they took uh, one of the other, and then uh, so it's my turn to uh, drive my mom to the market, and then I was the, um, thirteen. How how old were you? Thirteen. 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 Okay. And uh, my mom doesn't drive, and then um, so it was my job. My sister teaching me how to drive, like after school every day, until like I'm I'm really. Um, get used to it, but of course you can't get the uh, driver license. Yes, very yeah. young. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, I have to get up like two thirty in the morning um, to drive my mom to uh, Rama Four Market, which is like half an hour from where we live. And then I slept in the car because I had to go to school. So my mom goes shopping around until like five thirty in the morning. She came back, and then I drove the car back, place everything in front of the house, go to school came back and then she did like what left over and then plus what she bought for the uh, uh she cooked the food for the push cart right after the uh like four o'clock i came back from school and then she had like 10 different kind of curries on the push cart and then i came back i pushed the cart around the uh, neighborhood for like uh hour and a half and then we saw out everything and then this is like 365 days a year wow and uh, I get a chance to go the market tour with her on the weekend because of uh, Saturday and Sunday is day off from the school. So she teaching me how to pick the vegetables, talk to the uh, uh, food vendors, like how to get to know them. And then, you know, you get the special things, like they will keep something special for you. They will pick something like this is what you should get because of uh, you are regular as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for like two years and then, you know, I can see my mom like work really hard and then I don't want to be a chef like, like her because of, uh, I want to do something different. But, you know, I end up, uh, it's my turn now. I finished my college and then I went to uh, London. So my first job was the, uh, a pot washer okay. uh, at the Waldorf Hotel and then I cannot speak any English at all, period. Like. Well, wow, that's very adventurous of you. Yeah. Well, I was there when I was 16 uh, in London. And then I started my first job was the pot washer at the Wardorf Hotel. And then uh, 
And this is not the reason I came to London, but I want to learn how to speak English, you know, to take the business course for like two years and come back to Thailand to work in the office because of, uh, I don't want to be a chef at all. But I ended up working in the kitchen. Uh, the manager offering me, I was, I went to help in the kitchen and then it was like, you want to be a chef? And then I was 16 and was like, be a chef? No way. I was like, <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I'm like, well, if you want to be a chef, we could have sent you to school. And then I was like, oh my gosh, because my mom uh, borrowed the money from the neighbor to buy me a ticket for six uh, for a year, uh, return ticket, and then also to pay for the school for six months, to pay for the housing for six months. And then, you know, by that time, I think I can continue getting a job, like a part-time job because you're not allowed to work full-time. And uh, then, you know, that's how I start uh, cooking. I went to school and then I was there for two years working in the kitchen and I moved to uh, Australia to join my family, my sisters and my mom, my dad was there. Then uh, they have a Thai restaurant. Mm -hmm. So, but I have finished my apprenticeship. So I continue my apprenticeship in Sydney. And then since then, uh, when I was 18, I decided I want to be a chef. So by going to the cookbook store and then uh, reading, but not the recipe, a uh, reading why they become a sh like chef become a chef so they did a good training they want to uh you know open their own restaurant some have the cookbooks already because there's the cookbook on the shelf uh with that chef name on it so i i start to see the future like how those successful chef become a successful sh people yeah and then uh, so i kind of like go along that you have to have a good training you have to train with a good chef to learn and then you know the behind that is all working really hard in the kitchen 24 i don't want to say 24 hours but <laughs> you know, it's a long hours anyway yeah so that's actually my my uh uh i think my passion uh it came when i look behind when i was with my mom and and started up with her get up early in the morning go to the markets like this is more like in the old days right the chef had yeah. to go to the market to pick their food and and so on so on so on so i think that actually came later with my passion about love and love to cook and then um and then that, that's how i start i told myself like i want to be successful when i was 18 but i don't know what was successful to me Mm -hmm. in the future but i think learning um you know by mistake and and also uh you know you're working really hard and then it, i don't know what i want to achieve in the beginning but i i, I tell myself like i want to be successful that's how i started my when i was 18. Yeah. do you do you think that from early start you already started developing an entrepreneur mindset because some of our members were also wondering do you really need to have this f and b knowledge before and do you do you focus more on the food and the cookery or do you focus more on the business side so when your passion for food ignited at 18 what, what was the thing that you decided to focus more on did you have to divide yourself in everything matters when it comes to being a chef and a restauranter well uh, in the beginning i think uh the food came first because of you want to know you want to learn what you want to cook you know that that actually my early start mm -hmm. then uh, i think the business come in later because you want to open your own restaurants so then you need uh, money to to uh, to save, and then also you need a, an experience to yeah. run your own business, right? So a lot of chefs who did their uh, cooking school after four years, so they think they you know they know everything. They open the, they open a restaurant, first restaurant, maybe like three to six months, and then most of them fail. Mm. because they don't know how to run the business they don't know like they know they only know one thing that they can cook good and then they think that people can come but you know the business behind and then that business was you know you need to know you need to get you need to you have to have experience you have to know everything you need to uh know about front of the house you know how to run the business you know have you have to have the uh, costing, food costs, and then labor, 
and then uh, you know talk to your staff and 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 uh, human resource everything i think yeah. from the top to the bottom but is it then more and and um, excuse my ignorance in this sense obviously but is it easier than for a business person to achieve in the restaurant business mm -hmm. or for a chef because i i understand if you are passionate about your food Mm -hmm. might be more difficult to let go and decide, okay, now I have to focus on the business side that it's taking away from my creations and innovating in the food uh -huh. industry side. Well, to, I think you have to have both because of um, nowadays, like if I want to open the restaurants in, uh, now I just did open the restaurant in Taipei in July last year. And then I have to have a chef who actually had a mindset like first of all he cannot only just cooking okay he has to run his kitchen or his team and then different nationality they're not thai people then he has to have a mindset about the business in terms of food costing you know if he opened the restaurants and uh, people coming in and then uh, they want to talk to you they want to see you. Yeah. He actually had to step out to go to see the customer. If that person is the real chef or a, a Thai person, right? If you open a Thai restaurant, of course. And then uh, also you have to have a, a really good partner, like business partner. Uh, that is really something that you need to build by, mm -hmm. you know, getting to know each other. And then by the time it, it probably will take uh, quite some time, it might take a year until you're getting to know, and then you get married, right? Because you want to <laughs> and then now uh, because you, yeah. you want to get, uh, you want to open business together. So that's mean like you're getting married to somebody that you want to know, you want to learn. And then uh, it's not just about the money. It's just about, you know, everything that you're creating, your experience, and then uh, you have to have that, but that person, maybe that chef doesn't have everything. He just yeah. wants to cook, right? But you know, nowadays people want multi uh, skill, multitask. So you actually have to do everything. Yes, I guess at least to have an overall understanding of where are you stepping in. So when things happen, good or bad, you know how to react. And as you were saying, mm -hmm. to be very open to mm -hmm. the options and the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a rush. It doesn't have to be in a rush. We have a question from our members here if you're using phone or tablet no no still we are still waiting for some questions okay so i do have a next question okay you have the passion for food you have the business acumen and perhaps a very good partner mm -hmm. then when it comes to choosing the place where you want to open your restaurant how do you decide if you buy versus rent well this is the um this is the it's depend on the situation, right? Because of um, if you buy, it's really good because it's going to be your own space. You invest, and then um, a lot of people do that. Okay. Nowadays, since you just start up, it's going to be really difficult because of uh, it. Just depend on the uh, different country as well, different location. You know, uh, if the traffic is really good, food traffic people walking by and so on, so on, so on. Uh, it probably would be great location to put your restaurants there because of uh, a lot of people see, and then they walk past, they see it maybe next tomorrow, next time they're coming in, but they're gonna be like really expensive. Hmm. Uh, example, like I have a, a friend of mine, uh, they're from Thailand, they want to open the restaurants in uh, London. So they go where is the busy location in, Heart of London. They went to uh, Soho, which is a lot of tourists coming in, and then they opened a Chinese. Re uh, they opened a, not a Chinese restaurant. They opened a restaurant concept, which is the uh, if the tourists coming in, they're not going to go to that kind of restaurants. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because of, but the local people they live outside London, so it better for them. After a few years, they after a year or two, they, they move the restaurants to an outside skirt of London. So they get actually more uh, customer, they get cheaper rent, 
and uh, you know they make more money. Yeah, we actually had to study really hard. Like, if you want to open somewhere, it's really great location, and, and you actually have to see who actually living around there, who's gonna come into that area, what kind of your customer, uh, mm -hmm. point, and so on, so on. Go back to you, your question, uh, buy or rent. I think it just depends on the situation. If you have a lot of money, of course, you know, that's the good investment. Yeah. Yeah. I guess as you were saying, you have to do your proper market research and know if you want to go with the trend, the hype, is it about all the concept or it's also about your customer base. Mm -hmm. and, and for that, everybody's asking how much does it start to, uh, does it uh, cost to start? It depends on, I guess, the concept, but is, can you give us more or less an idea if it's a too expensive or well, we can uh, do something cheaper? Example, like uh, I'm sure, like from Hong Kong, Singapore, and Bangkok, completely different. If you, a lot of people who come here uh, from Singapore and Hong Kong to start up in Bangkok because uh, the cost actually cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually build the restaurant uh, right around uh, heart of the city, uh, around 25 million to up to 30 million baht, which is uh, I don't know how many uh, Hong Kong dollars. But it was around, um, let's say, one million US dollars. Okay. Okay. And then, but if you open in Hong Kong, it's going to be much more. You know, it's going to be much more. Uh, the structure, if you take over, it used to be the restaurants before. So you might get the uh, uh, kitchen structure, you might get exhaust, which is there already. So you don't actually have to do much. But for Bangkok, it's around. 30 million to have a, like 40 seat, 50 seat restaurants. Uh, it could, it can be a house, um, you know, a property with a garden, a little bit of garden, but you actually have to look around a bit. So that Bangkok, it probably would be 1 million US dollars. And you have restaurants in a lot of places. So I guess every time the situation was different for you to choose and decide where to go, how to do it, how do you manage that? And after that, we do have a question from the audience. <laughs> you can just let well, me so, know how uh, you manage uh, everything around it. Well, this so is the uh, um, female entrepreneur, which is the, my wife, Sarah Chang, which is the, she, uh, the person behind, always, you know, the great successful uh, man have the woman behind. <laughs> so she um, helping me a lot to doing all the talkings and then uh, business dealing, contract and so on, so on, so on. So she left me to be a creator, you know, okay. in the kitchen and then uh, because I'm, I'm really good at that. But of course, you actually have to know everything. And uh, so uh, she actually is sitting next to me and then uh, she could tell you a lot uh, about <laughs> uh, the business deal. And, Hi, Sarah. Um, and then, uh, 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 you know, the contract, uh, you know, and, and she has uh, friends around the world or uh, mostly like uh, either lawyer, banker, or, you know, uh, not the chef, just only me. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, she, she's actually do a lot of uh, uh, on the paperwork, a lot on that for me. So, okay. you know, and, and I'm, I'm glad that, uh, I have a, a great team as well. I have uh, two more uh, women in my team. Uh, one is in the kitchen, and then uh, she's been with me more than uh, um, over 10 years. Wow. And then uh, she's also a chef. And then uh, I have another person, which is the, uh, from the office side. So she's helping a lot with the uh, contact um, people and then people who want to contact me and then uh, getting a email coming in for the deal or you know some uh, business from customer overseas service. customer service something like that yeah yeah I just were saying you know, it's all about the partnership and the community that you build mm -hmm. and the relationships yes we have Rachel she raised her hand she is connecting from Canada hi oh. Rachel do you want to ask a question to Ian? Yes, absolutely. Swadika from Canada. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing um, your insights about the industry. It's fascinating to hear from someone so talented and experienced as you. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask you, I know a lot of people here in Canada 
um, are chatting about how difficult COVID-19 has been on the restaurant industry. But what, in your opinion, if anything, is something positive that COVID has done for the restaurant and hospitality industry? Well, uh, it's many things. Um, good things that uh, I have the uh, television to uh, helping well, me. But uh, that's more like on my side. And then uh, what I do, uh, we have a, a small kitchen in, uh, in my uh, property here, where my office is. And then we do um, a food delivery. Actually, we're doing uh, prep some today as well. So we, we're creating something, uh, you know, um, if they can't go to the restaurants, we actually have a system. Uh, they can order it and then we put it online. And uh, th that actually helping uh, my team and then helping uh, outside, not just to be uh, sitting at home and, and, and waiting something to happen. Or, uh, so we, we actually creating something. We, we sit together, we, we plan and uh, trying to uh, come up with activities like what can we do and so on and so on. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Kopunka. Kopunka, thank you. Rachel. Thank you very much to Rachel. And that was a great answer, Ian. Thank you. We have the question from our audience, and I believe she's Anna Wong from Few. And that also connects to the other question that I have. Some of her friends said that restaurants are a bad investment, they have lost money. And from our members in the community, they also think that perhaps food and beverage and restaurants are not very trendy as, let's say, startups or fintech or all of these hype new industries that we everybody's talking about, you know, tech. Mm. What do you think about it? What's your advice in terms of investment, how to attract investors, and is it a good or a bad investment? Okay, uh, I think uh, Sarah would like to answer that. Okay. Hello, sorry. This, we, we were actually talking about this not that long ago. Um, I think the type of investor who invests in restaurants are is a very different type of investor than somebody who would be looking at fintech and financial investments. Um, it, in our experience, a lot of people invest in restaurants because they're passion projects. Um, a lot of people invest in restaurants because they already are in finance or tech and they wanna do something different. Um, there's also a lot of innovation coming because of COVID, but it was already happening, but COVID has accelerated this process um, with technology, AI, um, and things into the restaurant industry. So this, these are areas that are fast developing that are areas of investment that relate to restaurants, but not in the traditional sense. So I think that um, there are angles that it just depends on what your concept is that you could look at, um, especially now that things are changing so rapidly. But like I said, traditionally, I, I think if you have a concept that appeals to people and you have a, you know, it's a lot of networking as any kind of fundraising is, but it's tapping into those people who have a passion or who want to invest in something else because they've already done the finance and the, the tech and whatever else. Hold you back. Thank, you, thank you, Sarah. And, and going back again, putting it together, you're saying that we have to be open to perspectives and open to opportunities. And I guess with the situation, things are not separated. They're not uh, only tech or only finance. They could be together and, and even a very interesting concept. So we have so many different concepts out there. There's a lot of competition in terms of restaurants or even celebrity status for chefs. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate yourself, Ian? Well, for me, um, you know, I, I, we do the research if you want to open the restaurants in, uh, um, in certain places around the world. Um, you know, it uh, doesn't matter in New York, uh, Taiwan or Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and, um, you know, right here in Bangkok as well. So I think it's really, um, first of all, you need to know your uh, market. You know, you need to know the culture because that is really important. I opened the restaurants in uh, Mumbai. 60% uh, of uh, people there is vegetarian, um, yeah. vegan. But I found it's not 60%. I found it's like 99%. <laughs> every, every person or everyone who came to the restaurants, they're all vegetarian. 
and they just do it by choice after they see your menu and they're like, oh, this is very interesting and we might as well do it or? Well, but, uh, you know, at the end, I went out and talked to them. I said, well, you know, why are you a vegetarian? Because I was really curious about it because everyone walked into the restaurant. We actually have like non-vegetarian menu. And then, of yes. course, we have vegetarian menu as well. But our non-vegetarian actually larger than vegetarian. And then, so I went out and asked, I was like, look, you know, what is it? Is that religion? They said, no, it's because of the health. They're concerned about their, uh, you know, health conscious and stuff like that. It's not about religion at all. And then it was like, oh my gosh, it was like, it's the whole Mumbai thing. Like, you know, I mean, of course, but they say that if you could uh, make vegetarian, like really great vegetarian, tastes really good, you know, yeah, uh, uh, that restaurant would be very successful. And then, uh, you know, I, I try my best and then I really into the, uh, uh, vegetarian menu. So I came back to open my restaurants in Bangkok. I have like one page of a vegetarian menu and um, I don't even think like Thai people want that so many people who crave or, or want to be a vegetarian, but uh, you get everyone who coming in and order vegetarian dishes. But that actually, I get the inspired from, from that. But of course you actually have to know your customer base. You need to know the culture, what they do, what they do eat, what they don't eat. Like if you go to uh, uh huh. It's the dining habits. Yeah, early, dining. Early, early. Yeah, no dining habit. And then uh, in Mumbai, everyone come to eat after the you know office hours, and then they leave like you know two hours away from Mumbai. They have to go back to their house and coming out. And then our restaurant closed at ten thirty because mm -hmm. in the hotel. And then by the time they're coming here, they come in at ten forty five. <laughs> You know, and then and that's actually that that's the culture, that's the habit, and then yeah. that's the, uh, like the routine of the um, uh, uh, in that country, and then same thing in Spain. They opened the restaurant in Spain, Nobody, yeah. And then it was like, oh my god, let's uh, book. We, I want to go out and eat at seven o'clock, and I was like, no, we're not. No. Open until <laughs> like, wow. It's very late. Yeah, I know. I'm from Mexico, and see, very similar. We eat very, very late. Oh really? And then I was shocking. I was like, I want to go to bed, like. You know, midnight. <laughs> no, midnight. We're still eating. We're just eating. We're just starting, and then they're going out like two thirty, three o'clock in the morning until party until like six o'clock. Yeah. Go home at six thirty, seven o'clock. I was like, that's crazy. But you know, that's the, basically they don't eat spicy. Okay. They don't, they don't eat chili at all. You know, in Spain, no. And then when I cook like black pepper sauce, they was like, this is so spicy. I say black pepper. <laughs> You, know, uh, you, you actually have to uh, know your customer base, so you uh, that's actually is a lot. So you know what local people eat, you know what they palate, and you know what they 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 enjoy eating. So uh, that's a, basically you can find and then modify your menu uh, to be uh, your style and then appropriate. Not you're not changing your style, you know, but you you actually have to know where you open your restaurant. To localize it, I guess. But what is the, what's the fine line? Because I have encountered and talking about my own cuisine from Mexico, mm. a lot of restaurant people they don't want to change. They say, okay, this is the way the dish should be. And as you're saying, us Mexicans we eat a lot of spicy, mm -hmm. and might not resonate with a lot of other people around the world. So what's that fine line between keeping your values, your authenticity, and localizing it to your audience? Well, you know, the uh, authenticity that you need to keep, you know, you can actually make it like, you know, like what you just said, fine line, and then uh, that's just your line. Then when people want more spicy, you can add more. But when it's too spicy, you can't take it out. Yes, true. You diluted your food. If the customer sent it back, they will say, this is too spicy, they can't eat it. So mm. what you're going to do, you're going to throw it away and, or you're going to dilute your food. So you actually have to ask yourself. So it could, it have to be like, you know, medium spicy, like everyone can enjoy it. But if you want more uh, spicy, I can blow your head up, you, you know, with the chili. I can blow your head away. <laughs> that. So uh, that you can do. So I think um, you need to have like a, like, if Mr. A coming in to eat, it was like, oh, this is wonderful. And B came in and it was like, wow, this is too spicy. And then the C was like, oh, this is okay. So you want 
in, in between. You want A-B time consistency. You want A, B, and C coming in. They really enjoyed it. And then it had to be that line. And uh, to keep, you know, uh, your traditional, to keep your... Uh, New York. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, like I did my green curry in New York City. And then uh, we have a uh, apple eggplant. Mm -hmm. Plant is kind of a different eggplant than you know European eggplant, and our eggplant is more a little bit bitter, but that's the way it is. And then um, every time I put it in, nobody eat it. And then uh, my staff told me, "Well, chef, why you put it in?" I said, "Well, you know, if I don't put that in, it's not gonna be green curry." like what I used to do or my mom used to make it or, you know, this is what in Thailand. But I put in, but I put less. Okay. If, it, if you don't eat it, it's fine. So it's not going to ruin because you pay for it already, but it had to be inside. It, it, it's my green curry because of, uh, you know, it's like uh, four wheels. It runs great already. You can't put another wheel in. It, it doesn't make any sense because of uh, everything, like, you know, the food has become... The food is really great already. You just, you know, make it uh, more yummy, more tasty, and then, you know, look beautiful. And you don't actually have to do much because of uh, that person, that recipe has been created for many years already, over 100 years. And what you need to do, you just keep the consistency. The spiciness, you can add it in. Yeah. If it's too spicy, you can take it out. You can't take it out. <laughs> I love that you're using that word. We use it a lot in our online sessions because consistency, it's important for brands and for people to get that celebrity status or, or the recognition of a brand. And this sounds like it's almost a balance between consistency, adaptability, transformation, and obviously educating people on what you're putting forward. Mm -hmm. We have another question from our audience. CT is asking, what is your perception on halal food or halal kitchen? Is it worth to attract customers worldwide? Uh, absolutely. Like, you know, for Thailand, everything that we get it from a uh, store, it halal, like, you know, chicken, meat. We got a lot of beef from Australia. It's all halal. So when you're walking into the uh, not halal restaurants, but all the meat, procedure is more halal uh, already that to uh, ingredients to serve except like you know uh, this restaurant actually serve both so maybe uh, country, right? yeah and also depends on the country that you are in as well like if you're in the uh, UAE of course uh, <laughs> you know it, it period so you can't actually serve any uh, uh, pork item or something like that at all and then you have to um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but U.S. is not that um, uh, halal orientated because of uh, it, it's kind of like really larger country. But of course, I, I think, you know, when uh, somebody who has that religion come into your restaurant and then they're asking if it is the halal, you know, proce procedure and stuff like that. But of course, it's really important as well. Yes. We go. Again, back and back and back to that part of uh, having your market research done and knowing your audience. One more question from the audience. And how do you retain your staff and sustain the great standards of your recipes? Uh, we actually have the recipe. We have system. And then um, what we do, uh, you know, example, like you actually have to cook one piece of beef for three hours they have to cook for three hours they, so it had to be a recipe written down because otherwise the staff coming back you don't have the recipe yeah i i did it three hours but i said three hours have to be the water that that temperature level has to be uh, had to start from that hours not like you put it in and then you count three hours okay so that should be the their system and then it have to be recipes. So, you know, in terms of uh, different uh, meat cooking, so I have every recipe in the kitchen. So the staff can look at it, you know, to make green curry paste, to make red curry paste, and then they know exactly what amount need to put in, and so on, so on, so on. And then how they have uh, procedure, like one direction, how to make that. So 
every time I have example like um, I have a gastro bar. They use the lamb shank. They do red wine sauce, and then I have a Thai restaurant with masaman curry. Same ingredients but different sauce. So the temperature of cooking exactly the same. Okay. So they be step one, two, and three. So that ha they have to follow the procedure. And you mentioned you have your female chef has been with you for 10 years. So in addition to that same question from our audience, how do you retain, retain your staff? Well, you know, they, um, we, we, um, we sit down a lot. We talk about uh, a lot of food, ingredients. So we're going uh, Iron Chef battle this Monday coming. And then we fight what we want to do within an hour. So we actually have technique that we want to do. We want to show to the audience. And then it was like, it's not enough for one hour because we can't do this. And then we, we actually shared the ideas and then uh, we, we love food and um, uh, we actually cooking uh, like almost every day. We hands on. Uh, today we prepping for the uh, Valentine uh, cake, uh, chocolate cake at, in the kitchen. Up, right after this, I go back to my kitchen and then oh, we lovely. do uh, uh, Wellington uh, to be on, uh, on on social media and then we sell it online and then um, uh, uh, next week we go I go filming Iron Chef and then another show for the the big kitchen and then Friday it's it's a lot of a uh, you know uh, yeah but to do that I think uh, the relationship is really important like you know um, we it's cheap. Well, I think we met each other since the two, year 2000. Okay. She came to, uh, I opened the restaurants in New York in 2003, and then she came over. So she'd been with me since then. And then she came back, she went to work a few hotels, and then now she with the, with the company. I think it's, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you know, you know each other and, and, and you, you feel, you look at, in your eyes and you know exactly but um it's a lot to do as well to keep that relationship for a long period of time and and um, um i i think i'm i'm just uh uh lucky uh, <laughs> to have the female uh surround me and then helping me and then uh, to make me successful as well as you were saying you build up those relationships you nurture them and, uh, it sounds like you empower your your team and make them part of the creative process the innovation and everything that it's happening around well i'm sure we could keep on talking for hours and hours there's so many interesting things that myself and the audience would like to keep on asking to round it up ian i would like to know how did you gain your celebrity status mm -hmm. how did you go, you get there because i also remember watching you in iron chef back in the day with uh, mari batali and all of these also great chefs and now obviously you're part of master chef in thailand how this this happened well i think um you i think i cook good food and then uh, when i did the battle with mario batali he came to the restaurants and then uh, not the team of the uh, Food Network, but himself proposed uh, Food Network or Iron Chef uh, United States that he want me to be battle with him, right? Okay. And then at the end, if you watch that, at the end of the show, he said, you know, uh, Ian is one of the, uh, not one of, he said, Ian is the great, you know, food uh, in United States. And then, you know, that PR you cannot buy. Yeah. Or you ask him, you pay him to say that. And then he said, Ian is not one of the uh, chef, best chef or something. He said, Ian is the great chef. And then that's period. I think, um, you know, from to hear what he say that. And then also, you know, when I get that in invitation and then uh, it being recognized. So I think it starts from that moment. But before that, I have my uh, cooking show since the year 2000. Uh, I did a uh, Thai cooking show here since the 2000 and to 2003 before I left to New York to open the restaurants. And then I think uh, when people saw me and uh, majority is mostly like housewife because of uh, the show is like four o'clock in the afternoon. So basically you're not at the office, right? So I have a lot of uh, 
all the audience who are, who my fan club. Oh like, yeah. Over 60. I cannot believe it. Like I walked to the shopping mall and then this old lady was like, Chevy, Chevy. <laughs> So I asked Sarah, I was like, how come there is no younger generation who like, you know, want to be my uh, fan club? She said, they're working at the <laughs> office. You know, four o'clock, they're still uh, at work. They're not coming out yet. But, you know, that back in the uh, year 2000. But uh, now um, I think it's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of luck as well. And then also, um, you know, the way people love cooking show, you know. Yeah. They can put the cooking show on. They look at uh, food and they look uh, maybe they look at you less or something. But if they you actually making them um, really to pay attention to watch, and then it was like I, you know, the master chef. I cannot believe it. Like a lot of people, uh, they tell their husband, like you know, I have to be back home at six p.m. I want to watch the show, and then that was phenomenal. And if you have more than uh, five million eyeballs to watch that like every Sunday so uh, that was phenomenal and then I think that as you know the kid as well the, you cannot believe it like I'm not like really mean to the kid but the kid would like it seemed like I'm, I'm really mean to the kids but the kid when they saw me outside they love me they want to uh, uh, yeah talk about food they were so shy but they, they want to be like next to you and then talking about like i cooking at home as well you know this is my dish and so on so on so that's that is really um i think because of you appear once and then people really uh look at you and then they really like it like you and then they keep they want to keep watching so and then also uh, every time i appear on tv I, I have to find something like really excited really cool attention to look at me like what i'm cooking you know give them some tips and so on, so on. So I think that uh, will gain um, the, so uh, yeah. And uh, to gain the uh, people who uh, want to see me and then want to see your cooking and then uh, really enjoy the uh, what you do on, on, on uh, celebrity show and stuff like that. That's wonderful. And as you say, there are indeed very, very entertaining. I am not myself a cook whatsoever, but I love watching this show. And they're very light, but you still learn. Mm -hmm. And to, to, to summarize and to wrap it up, mm -hmm. you said these very important words. You keep on learning all the time and finding new ways to be appealing to your audience. Mm -hmm. So you have a great understanding and reading your audience. Mm -hmm you have been consistent because that consistency i'm sure has taken you to the point where you are of success i'm getting a lot of happy faces on the screen i don't know if you can see them ian i'm sure everybody and at the audience are agreeing with me yes thumbs up and claps we love that interaction and last but not least i feel that you are fearless it's just let's try it let's be open and just enjoy the journey Mm, yes, yeah. I I really uh, I don't know why uh, I'm doing this. Like I, I want to work hard and harder, and 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 I do really, really enjoy it. And then, but I need to keep uh, motivation to my team as well. Like mm -hmm. you know, but it can't be just only me. I have to drive them as well. Like in the nice way, of course, and uh, to 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 keep them the. Uh, motivation and to give them the ideas and stuff like that and then you know they're supporting you back and yeah. then, um, i think this is a really good uh, uh thing to do with, with your team as well because about you cannot run the show by yourself you need uh, your team correct and it all if we if we were to think restaurants the journey to being chef to restauranter yay or nay i would have to say if you have the passion and you have a great team supporting you and you're able to seize the opportunities why not Absolutely. we are oh wow we almost got to the hour uh -huh. if there's no any other questions from the audience anybody wants to raise their hands ask something directly to ian I'm sure if you haven't got a question now and later on you have one, you can always connect with the Female Entrepreneurs Worldwide team and they will be able to connect you with Ian and many more of our very wonderful entrepreneurs and industry leaders that appear in our online sessions. Hashtag ask.
you everything. I would like to thank you very, very much, Ian. It has been wonderful and also Sara to be there and support you and give us some of the insights. We have more sessions next week. So remember to RSVP through the platform or message, email directly the few team members. Thank you very much once again to everyone. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Sarah. Thank Take you, care. Sarah. Please stay safe. My name is Jamilet, and I'm happy again to be your host. Till next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.